Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. My name is Jackson Mummy, and each week we'll be bringing you updated information about the bar exam and what you need to do in order to make the next bar exam your last bar exam. Ready to get started? Let's jump to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome. It is Wednesday, December 20th. Christmas is five days away, and the bar exam is about 80-some days away, but we're here. I'm joined, as always, by Judge Tracy, by June, and by Amanda. We've just come off of a really exciting and, I think, very helpful two-day Zoom event that we called the Bar Prep Boot Camp Booster. We had Tracy there. We had June there. We had Amanda there. We had Brianna there. And, oh, I was there. And, wow, what a great experience. It was terrific, wasn't it? Tracy, you were there all two days. What did you think? Yeah, but it was an experiment and it was um, very positive, I think, for the students to have the the one on one attention from all of the coaches and from colleagues as well. Yeah. So yeah, I think it went smashingly well. Yeah. And June, you did a couple of mindset sessions with people and uh, a lot of mindset sessions. <laughs> yeah. And he- it was amazing. Like Tracy said, it was our first time doing that virtually, and it worked out so well. It was really good, and I enjoyed getting to know a few students I knew very well, and some students I didn't know very well, so it was really nice to get to know and see, and I think, but also I think for students to chat with each other yeah. was a big thing yeah. for me that I saw and develop that connection. Yeah, it was great. And Amanda, you did some uh, teaching with performance tests. That was fun. Yeah, it was great. I think being in the small groups was awesome because a lot of students got a lot of personalized feedback and also could learn from each other. I asked the students if it was okay if I used some of their work as an example. And students were like, wow. Afterwards, I was doing that too, even though so-and-so did it. Like, I totally get it now. So I also want to thank those people that came and said it was okay to put their work on the screen because it's a really brave thing to do, especially if it wasn't your best work, but you helped your classmates. And that's why we're here. Everyone is like helping each other in the community get over the line. Yeah, it was uh, was a great experience. I would say from my standpoint, since I was doing the lecturing, I did bring some new material on both days, material that I've not lectured on before. And I was really excited at the reaction to that. It was particularly positive. We talked about some forms of activation on day one, super read and dip, skimming, rapid read, and some other pretty interesting approaches. And then on day two, I walked through the process of how you apply all this, whether you're a photo reader or not, to your studies for every part of the exam. And we recorded both of my lectures. They were about after editing, they were about 90 minutes each. And we decided that we had such good reaction to them. We thought, why don't we make these videos available to people that couldn't attend the booster? And that's what we've done. Most of you should have received an email in the last day or so offering the two videos individually for $250 each as permanent part of your library. Or if you buy both videos, you save $100 and it's a $400 package. It's simply you place your order and you'll be directed right into the course and you'll have access to both videos. Something else I did because they're relatively long videos is I used timestamps so that you can see the different subjects and the times that they come up in the video. So if you wanna jump right to the section on activating via rapid reading, you'll see it right there, jump right into it and you can grab it. I would invite all of you that were not at the booster to check out those videos. I think you'll find them incredibly helpful. This is really good material. So I think based on the reaction that we got to this booster, we'll do it again. It was, it was a really good experience, I think, for all of us. So thank you, those of you who participated. If you weren't able to participate, check out these videos. I do think they'll be helpful to you. And I'll just say this, you don't have to be a photo reader to find value in the videos at all. What we were doing was really designed to work both for photo readers and what I would call regular readers and certainly every student. So that was exciting. Thank you all. 
thanks to the team for all the work. Tracy did essay writing review and, and then Brianna was doing multi-state MBE review. So we covered it all. It was good stuff. So thank you very much. I want to switch gears for a minute and just let you all know, as we've been talking about just about every week, the next generation bar exam, the new form of the bar exam continues to be adopted in various jurisdictions around the country. This week, Nebraska announced that they will implement that test in July of 2027, and they are the ninth state following Kentucky last week, which also said July of 2027. Tracy, it looks like that July 2027 is becoming the default date for a lot of jurisdictions. Would you agree? I think so. I think they're pre-planning for law school curriculum, and they just can't make the switch in two years. So I think we're really looking more in a three-year bracket for most of these. Yeah. The other thing I would say, just if you've been watching the news, is that California continues to flirt with a alternate path to licensure. I'll say what I've said before, and it's been confirmed now in several different sources. This particular program that they're looking at affects 100 people, that's all. And uh, in fact, it's such a small group that they are actually looking for a benevolent donation from, I don't know whom, but they're looking for it to pay for it as a program. I think if California goes this direction, they're going to test it and they're going to roll out very slowly. 100 students isn't going to make any difference at all. These are people already in the provisional licensing program. So as we've been saying all along, you can't rely on an alternative licensing program, particularly if you graduated law school more than a few months ago. So it, it's a very narrow program at this point. So that's what I can tell you about what's going on in the world. Um, okay, just to follow up, this is the time when if you are thinking of upgrading your course, and you're taking the February 2024 exam, this is when you should be doing it. You have now a choice of working with Amanda, Tracy, or Brianna. You always have the choice of working with me. I do fewer calls than the other three coaches, but that's available to you on all of the packages. And I think all of us as coaches have availability and capability to add more students, but really the deeper you push into the exam period, it's just hard to get. It's not that we don't have the availability. We do. It's really more that we want you to have the time to react and get the feedback and then build and go from there. Tracy, I know you were working with a lot of students in the booster on their essays. There's a real need for that coaching, isn't there? There is a huge need for one-on-one -on -one coaching where we will work with you on your writing style. We'll work with you on the content of how you are expressing yourself will answer basic questions for you on the MBE. We'll work with you on MPT if that's what is on your exam. And I think the biggest intangible is probably giving you more confidence as we go through that you can actually do this and pass this exam. It's one thing to write the essays, but if you're not getting feedback from somebody who knows what it's going to take to pass, it's, it's a false floor, if you will. You can't really tell if you're on solid footing. So really encourage you to invest in your own future. I think it was Amanda that said, if you would do this for your child, do it for you. This is investment in your future. And there's so many different ways to pay for it. Don't let that get in your way. But you have time. We have time. Sign up. Let's get going. Let's get yeah. started. And, and to your point, Tracy, we do have the buy now later programs with Klarna and Affirm and Afterpay. If for some reason you got declined all across those, I don't think that would happen. But if for some reason you did, we would have a 12 month payment plan that we offer ourselves. So lots of different opportunities for you in that regard. Yeah, this is the time. Don't wait. Go ahead and and get that and get it taken care of and get started and choose the mentor that you want. They're all really good. <laughs> all right. We're going to jump to student questions here in a minute. I just want to let everybody know that Tracy's going to be talking at the end about a light in the darkness. I think we're close to the winter solstice, shortest day of the year. So a light in the darkness seems appropriate here. 
All right. Let me jump to the questions that we've got. We got a few in the last week or so. And the first one is one of my favorite kinds of questions. We get it frequently. And that is, should I write, handwrite, or type the exam? Let me throw that off to you, Amanda, first. Should you handwrite or type your exam? Yeah. So this has been coming up a lot, like coaching calls and one-on-one. And I think Again, we have a lot of non-traditional students here. So some people who went to law school and they hand wrote everything in law school, like that's just what they did. So that's where they're more comfortable. I would say the biggest challenge to handwriting is that nobody can write as fast as you can type, even if you're not a great typer. And also typing is something that you can get better at with free resources and not much time between now and the bar exam. And given the word count that you need to be successful, I do think typing is the better way to go. Additionally, I think like being able to outline on your screen, copy and paste is a huge advantage. Being able to reorganize things like, oh, no, I should have put that there real quickly and you can do it so quick. I definitely think it gives an advantage. Now, I don't think that means you can't be successful should you choose to handwrite. But one resource I would throw out if you're one of those people who's like considering is just go to freetypingtest.com. And I say, if you get over 25 words per minute, you can still type faster than you can write. And I also think on freetypingtest.com, they have plenty of resources. You could do 10 minutes a day to improve your typing speed. And that's just like free resource right out there. Get a few words per minute because on the MPT, we know many people got to get to 1,500 words. And the if you're doing MEE essays, 800 words. And it's a lot. It's not a huge amount, but I think it's hard to get there with writing. Yeah. Tracy, you were on the bench for, I don't know, ever 30 plus years. How many handwritten briefs were given to you by somebody other than a pro se litigant? Oh, never, never. Yeah. No, I wouldn't accept them. Sure. And I, I'm going to say this too, as a female to the other females that may be on this recording, there is gender bias in law and there's gender bias in the bar exam. If you handwrite women's handwriting looks very different from men's handwriting. Even if you print, like I've learned to print, I don't curse it anymore. It's still very obvious that a woman wrote it. And why would you add another barrier for yourself? Give yourself every possibility of having a a blind grading of your exam. And the only way to do that is by typing. Yeah. I I concur. You should type, 100% type. Sometimes something goes wrong and you have to handwrite. It certainly can happen. But to plan the handwrite, I think, as Tracy said, creates a barrier that you just don't need to create for yourself. And the quality of the work, I do not see better handwritten essays than typewritten ever. It just doesn't happen. And I know some of you did it in law school. It is not the practice of law and you just want to look professional. And I think that's part of it. So yeah, totally type the exam. Definitely feel like that. Okay. Next question we got was about photo reading. And I get this one, obviously, a lot. Somebody wrote to us, a student said, I don't know, is photo reading what I need in order to pass the exam? That's a good question. I think it is not an absolute, obviously, because we have students that pass every exam that weren't photo readers. But for the past 15 years, as I've taught photo reading, I would say anywhere from two thirds to three quarters of our students are photo readers. And it makes a difference. Their scores go up. Photo reading is one of those skills that just becomes a game changer for people once they experience it. Once they see it, they start using it. They realize what it gives them in terms of the speed of study, the ability to retain information, and just the confidence with it. Amanda, I know you were at boot camp when we taught photo reading. It wasn't as complicated as as people thought, was it? No, not at all. And I can say that with, as I'm somebody who didn't do photo reading for the bar exam or wasn't a photo reader who took the bar. And when I learned it, I just, you know, even think that it's a great strategy to have in life now. So I took my book home and 
I've been practicing photo reading here and there. And I think just to even get a little bit of an advantage, you don't have to be like this expert photo reader. It's like once you know how to do it, you just do it, right? And then you keep practicing it. So I think that's the beauty of it. It doesn't take long to learn it. And then you continue practicing just like you would practice your typing or practice your multiple choice until February. The other part is that in the booster this weekend, I talked about variations in the photo reading and regular reading world. In other words, I use the idea of a speedometer. Most lawyers read at 100 to 200 words a minute. That's traditional reading speed. But if you just pick up some of the techniques like super dip and skim, you're at 1,500 words a minute. If you go to the skittering technique, you're at 2,500 words a minute. If you go to the rapid read, you can get up to 5,000 words a minute. And then when you start photo reading, you jump to about 12,000 to 25,000 words a minute. And so there are these varieties of ways to read in. Photo reading gives you the most bang for the buck. It is well worth it, I think. And as Amanda said, it does not take long to learn. There are eight one-hour lessons. You do them an hour a day while you're studying for the bar. So there's still plenty of time to add photo reading to your course. And I think it will be a game changer for you. I know, Tracy, you've been exposed to photo reading now through the boot camps. It's pretty amazing to watch what students do, isn't it? Well, it is. And it's something that I never had heard of before I ran into CBR, but I can see huge benefits for it for the bar exam and beyond. The you know, number of cases that you have to read and the journal articles and things like that. So reading is an acquired skill that will help you in your practice too. So it's not just for the exam, but I think this is a good place to start with it. Yeah. So I would encourage you to add photo reading if you haven't. And if you've got photo reading and you haven't been using it, go ahead and use it. Check out the booster videos because we really do talk about how to use that skill as well as regular reading. That, that's where we are on photo reading. Let me stay in that world here. We had a question. Students said, when I'm sitting for the exam, do you recommend that we scan and do certain essays first or attack in the order that they're given? Let me throw that out to you, Amanda, first, and then we'll work through here. Yeah. So you mean like in the order of the course that they're given? No, like, the it's been on the test day itself. Oh, on test. All the essays and then cherry pick which ones that you want to do first. Okay. That's an interesting question. Yeah. So yeah. also if you're a photo reader, you're going to be photo reading quickly. So there might be one that you go to. For me, I'm, t and I've heard this before. So this is like personal opinion. I'm too nervous about skipping like an essay entirely. So I wouldn't jump around unless I was like drawing a complete blank. But even then, right, I would start with FLA with the facts. <laughs> And you can't draw a blank on that. And you can't draw a blank on the formula mm -hmm. to say party A, this is what they would argue and this is what the law would have to be. So for me, and this has happened to students I've coached too. They're like, I did this. I skipped an essay because I wasn't sure and I never went back to it, which is huge. So, and I think you're taking a little bit of a risk there in my opinion. And I think... There's no good strategy to that, in my opinion. I think it's like you go from one to five or however many you're given, because I know people have different jurisdictions and stuff, and you use the skills given here so that you can move forward robotically and methodically. So there was, and the thing is, you cannot be afraid to guess at the law or just draw up the law the way you see it with FLA. And you can't, if you sit there and you start going, what is the law? I'm stuck on this one. Let me skip it and come back. I think you've gone to your conscious mind instead of being in your unconscious mind. So you got to check yourself and get back there and just get down to business in the essay. Use the formula, start with the facts and keep moving forward. So I don't know, Jackson might say something. So I'd be like, listen to Jackson if he says skip around. But for me, that kind of makes me nervous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let me just say, I am not in favor of skipping at all. Every essay is exactly the same. Don't make the mistake of trying to cherry pick. You you run the risk that Amanda said of missing something, but you're wasting time. You just don't need to do that. And then your brain is doing all of that. Well, what was that other question about? And what do I want to do with that? And, and so you're bifurcated, I think, and it, it 
creates a problem. Let me change it just slightly. What if some, when someone's on the MBE, they've got the 100 questions, should they jump around the 100 questions or go from one to 100? Tracy, what, what's your thought there? You had a visceral reaction. <laughs> do not jump. Do not jump. You will mess yourself up so much. Do not jump. You, if you are looking at this and all of a sudden it looks foreign to you, just stop. Close your eyes. Remember what June has taught you about calming the chaos. Take five seconds, open your eyes, answer question one, answer question two, answer question three. Connect with your non-conscious brain and use your selective intuition and just methodically go through the questions, go through the essays, go through what you need to do. Don't skip questions. Please don't. It, nothing good happened. Really. And I know that there's a technique of going through and doing multiple passes. You take all the easy questions and then you take the next hardest and next hardest. And we taught that 10 years ago. But as we've gotten more sophisticated, as we know more about the non-conscious, as we know more about photo reading, as we know more about test taking, mm -hmm. it's clear that selective intuition will get you there faster, better, more directly, and you're way less likely to screw up your Scantron. And that's just the reality of the bar exam. So I'm glad Students are asking these questions, but I want to be really emphatic about it. There is no skipping. There's no reason to do it. Just plow through it. You got to answer everything. Just take them one at a time. And don't give them the weight of, oh, my God, there's this question in X, and it becomes huge. Or people see a, a MBE question, and it throws them, and suddenly they fixate on that question. They got 99 others to do. So that's why we talk about the 92nd selective intuition. All right, good. Appreciate those answers. Totally agree with both of you. We got a couple of interesting questions in the last couple of weeks. Students mm -hmm. asking us about the procedural parts of bar exam admissions. One student was honestly unhappy with us because they were had not signed up for the professional responsibility exam and they passed the bar. They didn't sign up for the MPRE and they had to wait now until March to take it. And the student said, you should have told us before the results come out that we had to sign up for MPRE. I understand your frustration. We obviously want you to be barred and licensed as quickly as possible. However, there is a very practical reason here. And that is that the bar examiners view any specific admissions advice to a particular student as being the practice of law, that we are taking on the representation of that student before the bar. And as part of the licensing agreement that I signed 30 years ago, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth and the bar examiners were far more freaked out about bar reviews, I think, than they are today, my licensing agreement, which still remains in effect, I cannot do that. Just flat out, I can't do it. And so much as I'd like to give you advice, I can't do it. And Amanda can't do it. And Tracy can't do it and June can't do it. It's just not something that exists. What I will say about this is you want to be a member of the bar. Deadlines matter. They matter every day. You got to be checking your deadlines and it's your responsibility to do that. And I'm not trying to fluff it off on you. It's up to you. So check your deadlines for everything. Check them for typing, check them for registration, check them for character and fitness, check them for tickets, check every deadline. These things are dynamic, not static. And I know, Amanda, you went through this a couple of times in, in the last few years. Am I correct that you just got to watch this stuff? Yeah. Too? Yeah. And especially the people who took the bar during COVID, like they were constantly changing stuff. I took it right, right after we're up until the week before we were talking about uh, like things with the COVID cards. Then they ended up not even checking the vaccine cards. There's just a lot of moving pieces. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess to a certain extent, they think that this is some sort of practice like for the bar because there's moving pieces and every jurisdiction does it differently. Just like if you're filling out like motions to the court or forms for probate, every county has its little like peccadillos and nuance that you have to follow. And so you do have to pay attention. And there's no way with how much things change that we could have a since we like help pretty much all states here that are UBE. There's no way that we could have an outline fully updated of that. And we, over and over again, we have to tell you. So 
if you didn't hear it from Jackson, hear it from me. You need to check the Board of Bar Examiners in your state, their website, to make sure you know what you need to do to be licensed. Know if character fitness comes before or after. Know what you need to get on the MPRE. And know if there's a state portion of your exam that comes before or after the bar. Uh, I think so. I've seen some other bar reviews that have put up some of that information. The problem is it becomes outdated almost immediately. And then if you rely on it, you're really in trouble. So don't rely on third parties. Go directly to the sources, Amanda said. In the same vein, we had a student who wrote and said, and I'm quoting now, please let me know when I'm set for the bar exam. And Jude and I had a heart attack. We were like, warning, we do not register you for the bar exam. We do not do your application. We don't get you. That was a shocker, wasn't it, when we got that email? It was. It was like, whoa, wait. <laughs> We just don't do that. We can't do that for all the reasons I just described. You are a grown-up adult. you got to register and take the bar exam. And we see this sometimes with foreign trade attorneys who just aren't clear on what the whole process is here. There are, I know that there are people that claim that they will do that for you. If you're a foreign attorney, be very careful about that. Again, that is the practice of law. And most of those people that are claiming to do that are not licensed and registered to do that. And you are running a real risk in having them do your application or admission. So it's up to you to file your paperwork. Go ahead, June. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, and it's not difficult. You guys, I can go to whatever jurisdiction's bar examiners online and follow the instructions and see the dates of everything that needs to be done. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not a difficult process. Yeah. You just have to remind yourself to stay on top of it and do it. Yeah. So there you go. So we're in the process of preparing you for the exam. We are not in the, yes, uh, the, the exam. Uh, not yeah. you have to take care of actually registering yourself. To take it. So hopefully we help this student uh, yeah. set them straight. Okay. Next question we got, we've got an MPT workshop. We have an essay writing workshop. And the question came up, is there a discount if you bundle those two? The answer is no, there is not. These are wonderful resources. It's two private coaching calls with Amanda on MPT, two personal coaching calls with Brianna on essay writing. And Amanda, you've also got a multi-state bar exam, MBE workshop, correct? Two yeah. calls? Yep, MBE workshop yeah. as well. Yeah, and th these calls are really valuable because they're really focused on just that part of the exam. It's uh, specific strategies and then you practice. So Amanda, in the MBE, there's practice questions, and in the MPT, there's a practice, correct? Absolutely, and we get you get feedback on both of them, and a lot of students always ask, how can you give feedback on the MBE? But by discussing the questions and your process in answering those questions, we can uncover the bad habits that you might be using to answer questions rather than using selective intuition. And I think you said this earlier, Jackson, we don't know what we don't know. So some students think they're doing it right, but then upon examination and by talking with someone, they realize I'm not doing that at all. So don't wait until it's too late. Just those two little things will give you a boost. And then you'll know if you need more coaching after that, and then you can sign up for more coaching. You'll know if you got it or you need more. Yeah, I think it's a good place to start. If the basic success course isn't giving you everything that you feel like you want, then use these directed workshop opportunities. And as Amanda said, then if you feel like you need more help, you can upgrade. Tracy, you've seen some students that have gone through the essay writing workshop before they come to you for their coaching. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it helps. It gives them a foundation for sure. I think the personal coaching is an important follow-up to, yeah. to that workshop. What we're finding is that working with somebody for a day or two gets you the basics, but to really hone it, you need to work with someone for eight sessions, if it's Jackson, 10, if it's me or Amanda or, or Brianna. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely think that's the case. We've tried to set up the course so that there's a variety of options for you and a variety of different price points. So to the student's question, no, there's no discount for bundling those two sessions but I think they are incredibly valuable and would recommend them to any student that's in the basic coaching. 
And frankly, if you're in the personal coaching or basic plus, you will still find great value in doing this preliminary work and specialized work in MBE or performance tests or essays. You agree, Amanda, that it makes a difference? Absolutely. For me, though, the best investment I made was in the one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I just discovered that pretty quickly. And I do think it requires you to be honest with yourself. Am I really getting this from the course or I still don't really know? And I know for me, like I was like FLA, I just didn't get it at first. Just like a lot of students that came to our booster, but getting to talk with a coach about it, that's when it really all came together for me. And I think there are plenty of students, like you said, who can get it from the basic course. I wasn't one of them. That's fine. <laughs> And here's the other part is that if you're in practice or you are working, you're hourly, there's a value I'll tell you. Right? I have. Yeah. in that value. When you've got that, I think what happens is that you get the opportunity to have us help correct problems really quickly. Whereas it might take you an hour or two or three to self-diagnose. And if you're billing $300 an hour, that's an expensive lessons. So don't be penny wise and pound foolish here. All right. We've got a, a straightforward question. June's probably the best one to answer this. Students said, I want to order printed books. How long will it take to receive them? But June, you want to deal with that one? Cause you're the, yeah, I know you're the book person. Yeah. So right now, especially with the holiday season, we're looking at probably 14 to 21 business so I'm just going to be straight up front with you. If you ordered printed books, say January 2nd, you probably won't get them until January 28th. Figure out if that's what you really need. There's a couple of other options. You can, if you like just to have physical, you can print the files one time for personal use only. I know it's a lot of paper, so you can actually Take the file, go to Kinko's, and they will print it for you. That's an option. The other option is just to go with your digital version. And then if there's something maybe you want to print or highlight, you can copy and paste that over to a doc and then just print what you need exactly. I don't think you need to print entire books. And here's the thing. Once you get used to reading it digitally, it becomes much easier. It's like with anything. Once we do it a little over and over, it becomes just easier to use. And that's the way we're going in the world. And just to say, you can photo read digitally. Yeah. In yes. It's on For online, digitally, your books, you can photo read. So we love our printed books. but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's taking a while because they are print on demand. And Amazon's just very backed up. Yeah. It's a shame. Now, if you're a July student, plenty of time. Exactly. Go ahead and get your order in. There's plenty of time for July students. Then February students, you're really going to be close. And I don't want anyone to not study because I don't have my books. You do have your books. They're in the course. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned July. We got a, an interesting question. A student in the UBE found out that they were blocked from sitting in the DC exam. There was a limit on the number of times that they could sit for the exam. And they then figured out, rightfully so, that they could go to another UBE jurisdiction and sit as many times as they wanted. So if you're sitting in Texas or DC, there are some limits in those jurisdictions. Again, as we said, you got to check with your bar examiners. Every jurisdiction has their own rules. Nonetheless, this student ended up applying for the July 2024 Maryland UBE, and they said, how do I study now for that exam date? Uh, which is a great question. Who on the panel wants to take that one first? <laughs> Any uh, takers here for that one? It's how do you, st uh, how do you prepare for studying for the July exam date? I'm starting mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, I would say follow the course. Like you just don't need to put in as many hours. You have an advantage of like, you can learn photo reading if you're not a photo reader. But I think the earlier you start pacing yourself, the less likely that life events and things that are unpredictable can throw you off. 
I don't think you need to put in 40 hours a week right now. I think you'd probably burn out a bit, but you can pace yourself and within your own schedule. Also, I think Brianna is a great resource for that in time management to make yourself a nice schedule from now until July where you ramp up starting in April or May. So I think there are also think about it like logically, there are plenty of students in law school that they'd start doing a bar prep course their last semester of law school because either their school office it or something and then they ramp up when graduation happens. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's good advice. I think what students really want us to say is you don't have to study right now if you're taking the Joel High exam. That is not what we're telling you. You need to be studying. You don't have to go as fast, but you need to work now. And it is so tempting, isn't it, Tracy, to just say, oh, well, it's July and I've got the holidays and I'll just wait until sometime in January. But what happens when people do that? Well, January slips into February, slips into March, et cetera. You can be working on your writing right now. And the better you get on your writing, then when you start into content, the better your essays are going to be right off the bat. What we're finding is that Students who are trying to learn content at the same time that they're trying to learn writing are getting bogged down. And what is happening is the writing is not good. It's not good. It's not going to do it. It's not going to make it. And so everything just gets completely balled up. If you're sitting for July, you have a beautiful opportunity right now to concentrate on FLA and learning that upside one and down another. You don't even have to write law exams. You can write other things, but learn FLA. And then when you start working on your content, it's going to make your mind maps much better. It's going to make everything that you do much better. So I say work on your style now and start your content after the first of the year. Yeah. And I want to make this, if you were sitting in a big box course, they would say to you, in fact, they would say you can't even get your materials for July for months. And that's because they're relying on memorization and they know that what you've put into your conscious brain is only going to stay there for a limited period of time. Because this course is built entirely differently, and that is to say no memorization, it doesn't matter how early you begin. I've got 1Ls and 2Ls who are registered and taking our course right now who won't be taking the exam until 2025. The reality here is that when you learn in spaced or stepped repetition, you can work over a much longer period of time without the fear of, I'm learning something and it's going to disappear on me. It's actually in the non-conscious and it's that deeper knowledge. So you've got a huge advantage if you're studying now for July, provided that you are actually studying. And to Amanda's point, we do want you to follow the order of assignments. You should not be cherry picking, jumping around and doing one subject now and then another subject and then another subject. You're just going to confuse yourself. And you're probably going to miss out on some of the continuity. I think many of you have recognized that in the design of the course, nothing really is random. We have set up step by step because this is what we find works. And so if something doesn't work, we change it. Over 30 years, I've changed a lot. But I'll tell you that following this order of assignments has some real practical application. So you shouldn't jump around. So great question. Glad that the student asked that. If you're a July student, get to work. It's okay. But maybe five hours or 10 hours a week, to Amanda's point, is plenty for right now. But if you really start saying, I'm not going to study now, Tracy said it well, January slips into February, slips into March, and suddenly you're going, where did all of that time go? And then you're feeling the pressure. So that's what we want to avoid. All right. I think I've covered the questions. June, do we have anything in the chat box we need to get to before we get to Tracy's? discussion? We're good to go. All right. Tracy wanted to talk about a light in the darkness. I'm not sure exactly what that means as always, but I'm going to turn it over to you, <laughs> Judge Tracy. And what do you got in mind today? This uh, winter solstice for so many people, me included, is really hard when we only have a few hours of sunlight every day. I think in Colorado tomorrow, we'll have nine hours of all is all. Uh, sunlight, and that's because the sun sets in the west, and our mountains are to the west of us, and so the sun sets much earlier. But even if you are on the east coast, you're probably only looking at about ten hours of sunshine tomorrow, and it's oppressive. 
And this week can be oppressive. Yeah, it's holiday week and cheers and all that, but it can also be really hard. It can be a financial strain. It can be an emotional strain. Our families are strained. Our political system is strained. And so darkness tends to just come around. I even remember 42 years ago now taking the bar prep and feeling this darkness that I was never going to get it, that there was so much, how could I possibly get through it? What happens if I don't pass? What is everyone going to say about me? And it, that darkness just comes in and comes in. So <clears throat> let me tell you a story that just happened to me today. And, and then I'm going to tell you another story that happened probably, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, but I've never forgotten. So I, I had this surgery and I was told that I didn't have um, any more to pay on it other than the copay that I paid. But yesterday in the mail, I got a bill for $2,163. Totally unexpected. Talk about the darkness coming in. Bad timing. <laughs> My dishwasher went out last week. I had to buy a new dishwasher. I don't have $2,100 laying around. And I certainly didn't plan for that. I had been careful to ask, what am I going to owe for this surgery? And this was a complete blind side to me. Boy, talk about darkness. I didn't sleep all night. I was anxious. I was going to call the hospital today, and I knew how the conversation was going to go. It was going to be, well, yeah. Too bad, you owe the money. I'm sorry someone told you you weren't going to owe the money, but you owe the money and we want it now. So I called and I talked to a very pleasant woman. And after I gave her all kinds of personal information so she could unlock my account number, she said, well, your balance is zero. What can I do for you? Zero? I got this bill yesterday saying I owe thousands of dollars. And she said, I don't know why you got that bill, but you can just ignore it. And I'm going to send you a letter that confirms that your balance is zero. Wow. Talk about a light in the darkness. When she went to work this morning, she had no idea of what i had been through, what I've been dealing with, what this week means to me what my emotional situation is, having lost my husband a year and a half ago, what this whole season has been to me being homebound with a surgery. She had no idea. And yet when she took the call for me, she was the light in my darkness today. Why do I tell you this? Well, it's not because I'm so happy that I am, I'm relieved, but it's because what you do and what you are trying to do, it matters. It's going to matter. And I'm asking you a couple of questions today because I think it's really important. Jackson goes through all the logistics and we talk about that kind of thing. But I want to ask you, who is the light in your darkness right now? Who can you rely on to call at any time to get a pep talk or just to be a listening ear for some of the frustrations you're feeling, your anxieties? the darkness that threatens to close in on you. Who is the light in your darkness? And thank that person or thank those people for what they do for you. How are you going to be the light in the darkness for someone else? When you are in a dark place yourself, having the experience of thanking someone who serves you a meal or rings up your groceries and you actually look at them and thank them for what they do, or you help somebody to their car, that can push away the darkness also to be of service to other people. So I encourage you to ask yourself the question, who can I be the light for in this darkness? Because we get very introspective, we get very narcissistic when we're trying to study for the bar, and nobody understands and all that kind of thing. But who can you be the light for? 
So I was on the bench. I don't know. I had a misdemeanor docket. Probably 150 cases I had to get through in one day. And I came in, I was in a foul mood anyway, because I think there was bad weather and trying to get to the courthouse. And we had some staff meeting and we were told all this stuff that we were doing wrong. And let's so I went into the courtroom and I looked at my docket sheet. Oh my gosh, holy cow. How am I going to get through all these cases? And about the, the sixth case, there was a man who was, I could smell him across the ring. He was so scruffy. He was so unkempt, unshaven. His hair was sticking out everywhere. It was obvious he hadn't taken a shower for a long time. And I called him up, his case, and I do what I always do. I said, sir, do you know what you're charged with? And sir, do you understand your rights? And sir, have you had an opportunity to talk to the prosecutor this morning? And this guy starts crying. And I, I looked down at his case, which was something very minor. And I looked at his rap sheet, which was pretty clean. And I didn't understand why he was crying. And I said, sir, you're not in that much trouble. You don't need to be afraid to be in the courtroom here today with me. And I don't understand. Why are you crying? And he said, your honor, it's been over 10 years since anyone addressed me as sir. I still get goosebumps when I think about that day. I should, this was just a case. I had no idea when I showed up that day that I was going to be the light in the darkness for this guy. What you do and what you're trying to do matters. Remember that when you're studying, when you're trying to get it all together, when the darkness threatens to come in. I can encourage you to get a candle light it, put it by you while you're studying, and remember, you are the light in the darkness of this world, and we need you. We need you to pass the bar. We need you to serve the underrepresented people in this country, in this world. All it took was me calling this guy, sir. It was the light and the darkness. Believe in yourself. What you do matters. You have a great holiday. Thanks, Tracy. That was fabulous. I would say all of you, Tracy, Amanda, June, Brianna, Bobka, you're all lights in the darkness for me. The reason I continue to do this work at my advanced age is because it makes a difference. You folks make a difference. You change the world. And uh, I can look at somebody like like Amanda, and see the difference that she makes in the world. And she was a student, and Brianna was a student, and June has been with me for what are we going on nine years now? Something like that. Nine. I don't know a lot. We've seen a lot of change over those years, and uh, part of the reason that Tracy is joining me as a par partner at CBR is because she makes a difference. She's a game changer, and uh, I'm very excited about that change in our structure here and what this allows us to do going forward. So we're here because it makes a difference and because you all make a difference and you make a difference to us. So thank you all for being here. I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas and holiday season. I will miss talking to you all, but I will also enjoy my downtime a little bit because I know when we come back, we're going to go hard at it. And I know that Tracy and Amanda and June and Brianna and Bobka and everybody else will cover for me while we're gone. But I think that's a perfectly appropriate way to wrap up today to think about lighting those candles. So thank you so much for that. And with that, everybody have a great holiday. I will see you in January and the rest of the team is here to help you. And let's go light some candles and be that light in the world. Take care, everybody.